Well, I'd like to welcome you back to What's Up with Prophecy today. Today we're going to continue with our studies on God's salvation plan. And as I've mentioned in the past, I have broken it down into four stages. And today we're going to continue with our study on stage two. So that's, we'll, that's our agenda for today. Now this is called the Tabernacle and the Desert Series. And like I said, this is 2B. So I have a question for you. How were people saved in the past ages? What was the mechanism that they were saved? Well, I've got this little chart here and I have it broken down into uh, basically three ages and then the millennium here as the fourth. So we have the age of the patriots, patriarchs. We have the age of Israel and the age of Christ. So during each one of these ages, there was a mechanism in, involved in, in which people could be saved. So during the patriarchs, they were saved by the sacrifice of animals for their sins. And the sacrifices pointed to Jesus' future sacrifice for them. The other phase is during the age of Israel. And during that age, the, the sanctuary services were a mechanism where their sins were transferred to the innocent lamb that they brought to the tabernacle to be uh, slaughtered for their sins. And so by faith in that service, their sins were transferred from themselves to the animal and then finally to the uh, tabernacle. And then finally, during the age of Christ, we, we find that Christ's sinless life and death on the cross, he paid our penalty for sin. So that's what the first two ages were pointing to. They were pointing to Jesus' future sacrifice for man's sins. And so by faith, as we accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are saved. So today we're going to focus in on the sanctuary service and we're going to find out a few things about how that sanctuary service works and how it saves the uh, individual from their sins, from the consequences of their sins. So the sacrificial atonement system was the center of the uh, sanctuary services, just as Jesus is the center of our salvation. That's all centered around Jesus. But during the tabernacle days in the sanctuary services, the uh, sacrificial atonement was the offering of an animal for their sins. So that's what that was focused about. So here we have several charts and I will go through uh, one of these today and the other two on future videos. So for the individual atonement, the children of Israel would sacrifice different animals or in some cases a grain offering or even birds. So there was a sin offering, a guilt offering, burnt offerings, grain offerings, and peace offerings. Now this is a bit of a complicated uh, study. It would take longer than I have budgeted here on this short video, but we're going to take a look at this here as we go along today. Now the next uh, type of sacrifice would be the priest or the priestly sac atonement. And that atonement is a little different because a priest was not a common person. A priest was a, a official for God. And so the, the, the sacrifices for him when he sinned, or we'll find out other people in, uh, in the hierarchy of the church, when they sin, their sin offering, if you notice here, is a, is a bull. Whereas for the individual, a bull is not one of the things that God required to be sacrificed. And then finally, there's the corporate atonement. And we'll get into that. There's two sacrifices that were done every day at the sanctuary. One in the morning, one in the evening. And that was a burnt offering. And we will get into that in great detail in an upcoming video. So these are the three types of atonement 
that God provided for Israel, individual atonement, priestly atonement, and corporate atonement. So we're going to be looking at today just the individual atonement. Let's take a look at the individual atonements and what they mean. The first one is the sin offering. It's also called the purification offering. This is the sacrificial offering we are most familiar with. The animal is slain as an atonement for our sins made in ignorance or unintentionally. Okay, the next one is called the guilt offering. It's also called the trespass offering. And it was a sacrifice made as compensation payment for unintentional or certain intentional transgressions. Okay, the third offering is called the burnt offering. And the burnt offering was a complete burning up of the animal in an effort to renew the relationship between our holy God and sinful man. The animal was burnt over the altar, except for the skin which was given to the priest. The following one was the grain offering. This offering was not made for sin, sin's forgiveness, but was made in gratitude to God for his blessings. Note that no blood was shed with this offering. And finally was the peace offering. It's also called the fellowship or communion offering. The offering was shared between God, the priest, and the person making uh, the offering. Or so let's now investigate how, how a person or their family's sins are forgiven in the sanctuary service. Now here we're going to do a little bit of review. If you happen to not catch the last video, I'm going to review a little bit of what we covered in there. So this is a little illustration of the tabernacle in the desert. This was just a small model that I purchased. I think I paid $50 for it. And it's a, it was a nice plastic uh, uh, replica of what the tabernacle actually looked like. And it has all the elements. So we can see here that on the, from the east uh, is the entrance, entrance curtains. And the next thing we see is the courtyard. So the courtyard will be mentioned in the Bible in several places. So this is what it's referring to. And then there's the bronze altar. It's also called the brazen altar and, or, or the altar of burnt offering. So you'll see it referred to several different ways there. And here is the laver. Now, uh, this is for the priests to wash their hands and feet uh, before they come before the Lord in the, the uh, tent of meeting. And that's the tent of meeting. This is the little, uh, it looks like a tent, of course, and it's referred to as the tent of meeting in the Bible. And in, inside of the tent of meeting, there are several things. There's the holy room and the most holy room. So these are the two subdivisions within the tent of meeting, the holy room and the most holy room. And in the holy room, there are several pieces of furniture, you might say. There is the golden candlesticks, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. So those are the three things that are in the, uh, in the holy room. Now in the most holy room, that's the second room, that's divided between the holy and the most holy. There's a curtain there. And in the most holy room, there is the Ark of the Testimony. So these are the key elements of the uh, tabernacle in the desert. Now we're not going to cover all these today. We're just going to be covering these three things, the entrance, the courtyard, and the bronze altar. Okay, so let's get into that. So the first thing we're going to look at is the entranceway. And of course, I'm just going to cover the highlights of these things and not go into the depth that you can find in many excellent books that describe the uh, temple in the desert. 
and go into more detail on this, but we're going to be focusing in on a few key points here. So we have the entrance gate, and it was uh, formed of a wooden white, blue, and purple and red material, and it hung on four pillars. Now, once the Israelites entered the gate into the outer court with the sacrifice, he was standing on holy ground. So they realized this. So this was not just desert ground they were standing on. It was holy ground. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is the courtyard. The courtyard was an enclosed space about 150 feet by 75 feet. So it was fairly small and it was about seven and a half feet high. And the courtyard, uh, the curtains on it, uh, encircled the whole thing and they were made out of linen, white linen. And part of the other uh, construction of the, the, the uh, curtain wall there was made out of silver. So this, uh, the overall temple was about 150 feet by 75 feet. So it was fairly small. So the bronze altar was placed near the entrance of the gate. This is where the sacrifices took place. It's, of course, it's also called the altar of burnt offering. So the bronze altar was seven and a half feet square and about 4.5 feet high and it was made out of acacia wood and it was covered with bronze because they had a fire in there so the bronze protected the wood from burning up. So each corner of the altar there was a horn. Now I'm, I, it's not real clear on this picture but there were animal horns that were put on the four corners of the, uh, the bronze uh, altar and that is part of the ceremony that goes on when you sacrifice an animal. It involves the horns also. So there are also four rings on the altar that were put there because the uh, temple was moved with the Israelites when they moved in different places in the desert. So they would pick up the, uh, this bronze altar with the sticks that went through the uh, the corners of each part of the uh, of the altar there, the four rings. Okay, so the bronze altar had a fire in it, and this fire was unique because it was never allowed to go out. The fire was kept burning, and it, it was the responsibility of the priest to keep that burning all the time. So the uh, the priests had to uh, organize and get firewood for the altar to burn the various uh, animals for the sacrifices. So who were the people involved in, in, offer, in, in the uh, sanctuary? Well, of course, there's the individual atonement. And he had a number of different animals depending upon the type of sin that he, he uh, committed, that he could choose from, but depending upon his sin and on, on his financial ability. So God is very gracious here that if you couldn't afford a goat for a sin offering and you couldn't afford a lamb, but you could afford an animal, a bird, a dove. So you can see here that God made provisions for all different financial abilities of the people. So there's different classifications of sins, and this is covered in Leviticus in quite a interesting detail. So atonement. So the priest made an atonement for the sinner, and it shall be forgiven him. This is in Leviticus 4.31. So what does atonement mean? Now, atonement is not something we use in our everyday vocabulary in talking with people, so a lot of people don't know what atonement means. So here's what my understanding of it is. Atonement is the process of confessing your sins to God, 
than transferring your sins to the innocent sacrifice. So you confess your sins and your, your sins are transferred to the sacrifice. So in the temple service, an innocent animal, and we just looked at the various animals there, is killed for your sins and its blood is sprinkled on the horns of the bronze altar. So remember I showed you the horns on the four corners there? So the innocent lamb's blood is sprinkled on the four uh, corners there. So let's continue here. So if, and this is from the Bible. So if anyone of the common people sin unintentionally, so we're talking about the common people here. We're not talking about the priests or we're not talking about the officials of the government. So if the common person sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of the Lord in, in which uh, it ought not to be done and is guilty of that. So what does he do? It says, or his sin, which he has committed, comes to his knowledge. Then he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin, which he has committed. So this poor little baby goat that didn't do anything wrong will be brought to the service at the tabernacle and the sinner will place his hands on the head of the animal and confess his sins and then he would cut the jugular vein of the animal. So he lays his hands on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. Now this is still quoting from the Bible. Then the priest shall take some of the blood with his finger and put it on the remainder, put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour the remaining blood. Where does he, what does he do with it? He pours it at the base of the altar. So make a mental note of that. Later on in other studies that we'll get into, We'll talk about the blood under the altar. And this is what it's talking about. The sacrificial animal, the excess blood that is not needed for putting on the four corners, the four horns, is poured out at the base of the altar. And he shall remove, remove all its fat, as fat is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So the priest shall make an atonement for the sinner for him, and it shall be forgiven him. And you can read this in Leviticus 4, 29 uh, to 31. So this is the general uh, procedure for the various sins that you would do. You would bring the sacrifice to the altar, I mean to the uh, tabernacle, and in front of the priest you would put your hands on the animal, you would confess your sins. You would then kill the animal by, uh, if it was a lamb or a goat uh, or a bull, you would cut its jugular vein and it would bleed out and die. And uh, the various parts of the animal would be burnt on the altar. And your, your sins would be transferred from you to the animal, then through his blood that's put into the, uh, on the horns, that will be transferred into the tabernacle. So the tabernacle ends up with the sins that you committed and they accumulate there all throughout the year. And we will talk about what happens with these sins in a future video. Okay? So here are the four players, you might say, in this uh, service. We have the sinner, we have his stinky old sins there, we have a sacrificial animal, and we have the tabernacle. So how does this work? Well, the individual atonement, the sinner comes to the sanctuary, and what does he do? He has his sins that he's going to uh, confess, and, and sometimes it's not just his sins, it's the sins of his whole family group because they, they actually didn't have time, if you will, for every single person to go through this ritual. So the head of the family 
would do the uh, sacrifice for the whole family's sins. So the sins would be brought to the tabernacle to be confessed on the head of the lamb. So as the, as the sins are transferred to the lamb's head and the lamb is, uh, is killed, his jugular vein is, is, is cut, then what happens? Then the person is forgiven. So he is immediately forgiven because his sins are, because of the service that he's going through, his sins are transferred from his head to the animal and then it's transferred to the t uh, tabernacle. So we read in the Bible, in the New Testament, we read John 1, 29. It says, Behold the Lamb of God, and that's Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. So just like here in this example where the sinner's sin is taken away to the Lamb, which represents Jesus in the future, Jesus took away our sins. So our sins are transferred to Jesus. And then they're transferred into the tabernacle. So your sins that you confess are initially, you put your hands on the animal, they're transferred to the animal, and, and then the blood from the animal is put onto the altar in the sanctuary. And so the sins end up into the, uh, the sanctuary and this, the sanctuary becomes polluted, if you will, with the sins of the whole uh, nation there, all 12 tribes. And once a year, there's a process that they call the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I will cover that in a future video. So we will cover what is called God's sanctuary and how it is cleaned from these sins. Okay. So I have a trick question for you. And I, I, I've asked uh, different people over the years this question, and it's interesting the answer you get. So, does God forgive your sins? And most people will say, oh, of course God forgives my sins. Well, technically, he doesn't. What he does is God, if you repent of your sins and ask God's forgiveness, what will he do? He will forgive you of the sins, of the death penalty that goes along with the sins. Why? Because they were paid for in full by Jesus. So the sins are not forgiven, but the sinner is forgiven. See the difference? So at the great white throne judgment, the saints sins will be placed on the devil's head by Jesus. So that's where the payback has to come. And Jesus and the devil will pay the penalty for the sins he has caused others to commit along with his own sins. So today we looked at how an individual or family sins are forgiven. In our next video, we'll see how a typical service is conducted in the tabernacle for the priest's sins. It's a little bit different because a priest has a different rank, if you will, with God. He has a more serious role. So we hope you've gotten a blessing here today. And if you have, and if you watch this on uh, YouTube, uh, don't forget to subscribe to, this, uh, to the uh, videos and hit the like button if you've gotten a blessing from it. And this helps me to have more people view these prophecy studies and get a blessing from them, I hope. I don't get paid for these, but I do hope that you get a blessing from this and this will encourage you to study your Bible more. The other thing here I want to mention is that we have apps for various smartphones and tablets. So if you want to not miss out on any of my prophecy videos, if you download one of these apps for your Apple device or your uh, Android device, and you will automatically be uh, getting these videos when they come out. 
So when you search in one of these uh, app stores, just search for Bible Prophecy Revealed. And you'll see it come up with that little circle. It'll say Bible Prophecy Revealed. And if you click on that, I think they're free. They may be a dollar or two at the most. Uh, I've kind of lost track on what they are charging for that. But uh, anyway, they're worth it because then you can look at any of my videos anytime you want. Well, that's the end of our uh, video today. We hope you've gotten a blessing from it. Uh, and if you have, leave a note and let me know what you think. If you have questions, let me know also. God bless you.